Okay, so our next speaker is Richard Storer from Mathembed Limited. Uh, Richard's a senior security consultant. Um, he specializes in security analysis of embedded systems and security training for software engineers and architects. And the title of Richard's talk is Finding Security Vulnerabilities by Fuzzing and Dynamic Code Analysis. Hello, good afternoon. Um, I thought I'd come along with a little bit of a good news story for a change, um, hopefully to cheer you up. Uh, the title of the talk is Finding Security Vulnerabilities by Fuzzing and Dynamic Code Analysis. And this is really just a, a kind of a heads up for a, a technique which is causing a bit of a, a quiet revolution in the open source community. If we look at the top <coughs> code security vulnerabilities uh, from this chart here, this is from the Common Weakness Enumeration Project. So this is code vulnerabilities. So this is uh, not looking at um, insecure systems from the point of view they've got default passwords or uh, weak certificates or no cryptography or anything like that. This is pure um, code insecurity. So what, even if you get all of those infrastructure things right, how can your code be vulnerable? And the, the top two, three really don't change much over time. I don't know when this chart, I don't know the date of this chart exactly, but um, they don't change very much over time. So the big one is buffer error errors, buffer overflow errors, which can cause stack corruption or heap corruption or things like that. And the next one is input validation, which causes things like command injection, SQL injection. And number three is resource management errors, which is things like dynamic memory allocation errors, double free, use after free. And these can be exploited, uh, and these are the way that code is exploited um, by uh, hackers. And it leads to things like the, the program data being modified, the flow of the program being modified, or even arbitrary code execution, people to, able to put their code on your platform by um, taking advantage of these vulnerabilities in, in the code itself. Um, let's look at the, the biggest one, buffer overflow. It's often due to a lack of bounds checking in C by which I mean that in C, the programmer is responsible for making sure that you don't write outside the bounds of a, a block of memory, a, 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 an array of characters, or something like that. So for example, here's a very little program. We've allocated a buffer of eight characters. We've passed a pointer to that buffer into a subroutine, which uses a, a weak, a now deprecated function, to fill that buffer and does not check that you're not going to write more than eight characters into it. So this will allow me to type in at the keyboard uh, any number of characters which will get written at the, this pointer here and will overflow the memory bounds that are allocated for this buffer. And when it overflows it, it will corrupt the stack frame for this function. And that's the beginnings of the attack by modifying the return address of the function or something like that. Um, why does this happen? It happens because we don't sanitize our inputs, we don't check bounds of memory buffers, we don't test all the code paths, so we don't test for uh, illegal entry here, we, we, uh, and also because the bad code is often hard to locate. So why we know about these things, these are all down to the um, programmers not doing their job quite properly, the stand to test are not doing the job properly. Why is the bad code hard to locate? If we go back to that little example, we've created the buffer here, we pass the memory pointer to this subroutine where the buffer is filled and overflows, then the memory pointer uh, is this memory pointer here that's changed. We pass the memory pointer again to another subroutine uh, there still may not be any problem with that, all right, we've corrupted the stack here, but no one's looking at that stack yet. So we carry on, and then we pass it to a third routine, which again, can work perfectly normally, um, and it's only when we return from this last subroutine, that, and we go back to look at the stack here, that we notice that something's gone wrong. Uh, so we've been through all of these subroutines, doing different things to this buffer, and it's only at the end of the uh, top level routine that we notice that the stack has been corrupted and we've got a problem. 
So this is a very simple program. If you can imagine a complex data structure which is being passed from subroutine to subroutine into libraries, back out of libraries, and you, you, you've no idea where the actual corruption to the, to the stack got caused. It, and it only has an effect uh, when you exit the top level routine. If it has an effect at all, the effect that it has is completely data dependent, architecture dependent, all sorts of things. So that's why it's hard to locate the code. Um, here's the at example running. I type in um, my, uh, my string that's longer than eight characters. I go through the various subroutines and it's only when I leave the top level function that the stack protector kicks in. So GCC now enables the stack protector by default. And what that does is that it puts a, uh, a canary on the stack here and it detects that the stack's been corrupted, but only at the point where it wants to use it to get the return address. So that doesn't help us to isolate the problem very much. However, in the last couple of years, there's uh, been a lot of development in compilers, uh, in particular in a, th in a thing called code sanitizers. And the address sanitizer is particularly good at detecting runtime um, memory bounds uh, errors. Uh, things like heap stack buffer overflows and um, memory allocation overflows, uh, use after free, double free memory leaks where you uh, forget to free memory resources. It's um, a compiler option. Uh, in recent versions of Clang and GCC. And if I go back to my little trivial example, uh, and I compile it with the address sanitizer turned on, and I type in my word that's more than eight characters long, immediately that first level function, uh, that first function call ends, I get an error from the address sanitizer. It tells me that there's been a stack overflow, but it tells me more than that as well. It gives me very detailed information, a memory map, and it tells me exactly the source code line where the stack was overflowed, and it also tells me what bit of stack was overflowed. So it says, this is the source code line that caused the problem, and this is the memory that was corrupted. Exactly the information I need to know to isolate the problem. So that's an improvement. There is a downside. There is a very high performance penalty for using this sort of, uh, this sort of um, uh, <coughs> protection. Because it modifies your code, it instruments your code to be able to detect exactly when the, um, the memory is overflowed. So um, if performance is not a problem for you, you may want to, there may be reasons why you want to enable that in production code but it's more likely that you're going to use that for uh, initial testing and in your production code you're going to use a lighter weight um, mechanism like the, like the old um, stack canary mechanism. Okay, so we found a bit of a problem to locate hard code. You can use compiler sanitizers. Um, what about testing all code paths? Well, there are one mechanism for incre increasing your code test coverage is um, fuzzing. A bit of a reminder about what fuzzing is. The, uh, the term fuzzing was coined by university professor Barton Miller, who uh, was logged in over his uh, 1200 board modem on a stormy night and found that the things that he was typing to the college computer, the Unix computer, were getting corrupted along the line and that this caused some of the normal Unix utilities to crash. So he thought that this was interesting, and um, he started a student project to build a fuzz generator, and this is where the term originates. And they were very successful. They found that between like a quarter and a third of utility programs on various different Unix utilities, on various different Unix platforms, uh, would crash with random, random inputs. Um, so other people have done similar things before this, but you know, put rubbish input into programs to see what happened. But I think this was the first time that somebody took um, a kind of uh, academic approach to identifying how this would work. And they found that it worked very well. If we, um, it works well because <clears throat> the random inputs are creating new cases that your, your testers and your developments 
hadn't thought of and gives you a better test case coverage. If we fast forward to 2014, uh, Google um, proudly announced that they had found 1120 bugs in the FFmpeg library. This is a library for handling uh, compressed media. Uh, found by fuzzing, mostly by fuzzing. And they estimated that 10 to 20% of those were exploitable security vulnerabilities. In other words, buffer overflows and so on as we've just been looking at. Um, it was a big project. They gathered together 7,000 media files from the internet. They had over 200 cores at times randomly changing the data in these media files to see if they could make the FFmpeg library fall over. And it took several dozen iterations over two years. So it's a big project, uh, not the sort of thing you could just build into your continuous integration system. However, <coughs> um, not the however yet. Uh, so fuzzing normally works by taking good data, so this, um, in the Google case, these 7,000 uh, files they got off the internet, and making random changes to them, flipping bits, swapping bytes around, uh, extending the input fields or, uh, or truncating input fields, putting in corner cases like 0 and minus 1 and FF and things like that. Um, the problem with that is that it can be very inefficient if a lot of those cases don't penetrate deep into the code. So, for example, if the first layer of your code is a, a, a cyclical redundancy check, then not many of the random changes are going to cause valid data to get through the first level of your input. And there are various uh, solutions to get around this. You, um, you, can, you can just keep the good data, so you can generate lots of fuzz data, find out what does get through and keep it. You can um, add a sort of a fix-up level, so you can randomize a, a packet of data and then add a valid CR. RC on the end of it to make sure it gets through that check. Uh, you can have a special version which you compile without certain bits of validation to get the code deeper into the, to get the data deeper into the code. Uh, you can create stub libraries which um, in, in effect is kind of the same as that without the validation in. Uh, fuzz the layers separately so that you, for example, you could fuzz your HTTP traffic but put it into valid IP packets so that it gets through the IP layer and it's, you're only actually fuzzing the, the HTTP layer of the, of the network protocol. Uh, and using some or all of these techniques, there are some specialist fuzzers for common protocols like, like HTTP. Um, however, recently, uh, there's a new fuzzer in town called American Fuzzy Lock named after the uh, breed of rabbit of the same name. And this one um, has solved this problem in a much better way because the, the fuzzer, the bit that randomly changes the input data, is combined with a code coverage tool. So it, it instruments your code to detect which paths through your code are being, are being um, discovered, being exercised, and it remembers which data hits which code paths. And in that way, it's able to uh, do much better at uh, finding its way into the code. The, the guy who created this um, even uh, did a demonstration where he started with the word hello, and he launched it at a, um, a, a JPEG decoder, and after a while, the fuzzer was generating valid JPEG files because it had worked out how to get through the different bits of the JPEG decoder. Um, if I run American Fuzzy Lot on that little trivial example there, it'll tell me lots of information about how it's fuzzing the data, and it'll tell me that it's crashed it 2,087 times in 10 seconds, and it's kept one, um, uh, one example of that crash. So it keeps the data which causes the crash that identifies where the buffer overflow is. And I can use that to then uh, uh, for, um, uh, for testing later to make sure that I fix the problem. So coming back to this slide, 
Um, now we, we've got a solution for locating difficult code, we've got a solution for testing all the code paths, and together uh, they are um, causing things like this to happen. This is um, uh, 13, no not 13, 11 emails covering 13 security vulnerabilities posted to the open software security mailing list. So, um, uh, Mr. Uh, Sir Rubbo has identified 10 um, security vulnerabilities through buffer overflows and three through um, unsigned behavior sanitation, uh, all uh, using this sort of technique. And if you look at these emails, each one is the output of the address sanitizer in this case and with all the details of the source code line that caused the problem and at the bottom, a note, this bug was found with American Fuzzy Lock. So, to, uh, to summarize, the intelligent fuzzers create test data that you hadn't thought of, improve the code coverage, and there's two main examples of that, American Fuzzy Lock and a similar one called LibFuzz. Uh, compiler sanitizers isolate the problem, and as well as the address sanitizer, there's also a leak sanitizer, thread sanitizer, memory, and undefined behavior sanitizer. And work on these continues, they can carry on getting better. And between the two, we're finding a lot of security vulnerabilities in open source code. Uh, lastly, just to mention, I said that this isn't the sort of thing you could build into your continuous integration system, but that's exactly now what Google are doing. They are continuously fuzzing each new release of what they consider to be open source uh, code. And if you pay Microsoft, um, they will do some fuzzing for you as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> do we have time for questions? If there are questions? I think there's definitely one online, so maybe I'll ask the online one first. Um, could you have found some of these bugs through static analysis rather than fuzzing? Um, well, static analysis tools, in, in my experience, don't tend to be very good for things that are, that are runtime dependent like buffer overflow. They will tell you if you've written bad code, so if, oh, you, right. if you haven't identified, if you haven't checked your inputs, they will point you at that, okay. but that, they won't find all these bugs. Okay. Okay. It reminds me a little bit about what we've been doing hardware verification in terms of constraint random, and I guess your sanitizer is our assertions. And is there any sort of equivalent of functional coverage in, in what you do? Or is code, code coverage only? So, so the code coverage um, uses in American Fantasy Lot, it's using an open source code coverage tool which you can use independently from the fuzzing. Right. But there's no equivalent of functional coverage, which is what we're, we're, we're doing hardware verification. You know, that use case coverage type thing. It's only code coverage, isn't it? I guess not directly. Okay. okay. There's one more question online, I think. Um, ah, it's a question I've just asked. Okay. So, <laughs> it's the same idea, constrained random verification. Okay. okay. Um, are there any more questions in the room? Okay, and we'll therefore move to our last speaker of this session. Thank you.